Welcome, I'm so glad you could all come. And we really do have a sensational panel, but before we begin, I think we need to give a round of applause for the organizing committee for this dinner. Really. <laughs> a They've really done a sensational job. Our first panelist is Mary Cranston, and she is a senior partner at Pillsbury Madison Shaw Pittman, and she is the first woman ever elected to be CEO of a Global 100 law firm. And she's also been named several times as one of the most, one of the hundred most influential lawyers in the United States. So, Mary. <laughs> Are you going to introduce everybody? Or no, okay. why, don't we, why don't you start? Well, it's really an honor to be here. And um, what we were asked to do first is just give a brief storyline of, of our careers, and I'm happy to do that. I started out uh, making, I think, what might have been a mistake early on. I, I had a choice of uh, the Stanford Business School or the Stanford Law School. And I went to the Stanford Law School because my husband uh, had just graduated from the Stanford Business School, and there were three women in the class. And uh, they were great women, but it was kind of a tough road. And so the law school at that time had about 20% women. So on that basis, <laughs> I chose law. I shouldn't say it was a, a terrible mistake, but there's a lot about business that I think is, as you'll see from my career, really more kind of congruent with who I am. So um, when I graduated from law school, I went to Pillsbury Madison Sutro, which was the oldest uh, and, and best law firm in California, at least in the San Francisco area. And I've been there ever since. It's changed uh, in size, scope, scale, and in every way, including the name, but it's, it's still the same law firm. And I started there in 1975. Um, I was the first woman uh, hired into the litigation department. There were a couple other women in the firm, which has had a very profound impact on my career, because many women of my generation had no other women ahead of them, but I did, which is very fortunate. So I was there about three years, working my way up the ladder, and. Uh, I, went, I went to law school a little bit late, so I decided I wanted to not put off having children, so I decided I would have a kid, and uh, this will really sort of set the, the perspective on how much change there's been in the profession. And this was 1978, and there were no law firms in San Francisco that had a maternity leave, nobody. So I went to Pillsbury, and I asked if they would put a policy in place. It's one of the reasons why I've always loved the firm and been very loyal to it. They said, absolutely. And uh, that maternity leave uh, produced Susie Cranston, who's a graduate of the business school. She'll be here later. She's a little late. She works for McKinsey now. And uh, she was in the class of 2004. And then a few years later, I had a second maternity leave, which resulted in a current student in the business school, John Cranston, <laughs> who's hopefully going to graduate in June. Right, John? <laughs> yeah. um, I became an antitrust and securities litigation uh, specialist and like to do big trial work. And about part way through my career, just after I made partner actually, I had what I think is probably the most important insight in my career, and I'm going to tell it to you because it's my best tip actually. I discovered the uh, power of vision, and I think for women of my generation it was really critical because you didn't have obvious pictures ahead of you of people like you doing what you wanted to do. And I did a lot of reading in it, I read um, business books sports books, spiritual books, all about how to visualize yourself doing various things. And I set some pretty aggressive goals for myself. I decided I wanted to be a litigator, not in demand in the firm, which I already was, but in the external market. And I wanted to really lead large, the largest cases. I wanted to be the, the top lawyer. And I wanted to be a big rainmaker, because in law firms, rainmaking is power. And I didn't know any women who had ever done that. So I had to kind of create pictures for myself. Uh, it took me five years, but I was able to do it. And I began to realize that by setting a goal, staying very focused, and then doing the hard part, which is facing your fears about why you can't do it. And we all have these fears in our head, and actually that's truly what stops you. And you have to face them, and you have to go for it anyway. So um, that really changed my career. All through my time at Pillsbury, I always liked management. So I would always do, you know, significant uh, internal jobs for the firm as well as my legal practice. And I headed litigation and headed marketing. And there came a point when we needed a new chair of the firm. And the firm wanted um, uh, someone who could uh, act as a change agent. 
it was a time in the firm's history where our successful marketing strategy of being the leading firm in San Francisco was no longer going to make it in the, in the bigger world, in a globalizing world, in a consolidating world. So we, we needed to make some change. And I was asked to do it. It was, um, as a female, I was uh, pretty scared because I realized that if I failed, it would be really <laughs> very noticeable. So, um, you know, but I, I, I just kind of used the same techniques I'd used for dealing with fears and vision. I just went for it and used um, vision as one of the motivating techniques for making the changes at Pillsbury that were necessary. So that happened in 1998. I was a CEO for eight and a half years. I just stepped down. During those years, uh, we took the firm from a local Northern California organization to a worldwide firm. We did it through two big mergers and a number of acquisitions. We tripled the gross revenues. We doubled the number of lawyers. We now have offices in London, Tokyo, Shanghai, Sydney, and all over the United States. Um, and the, some of the accomplishments I'm most proud of is that we're recognized as one of the top firms in the world for women. Re received numerous awards. Last year we got uh, put on the list one of two or three law firms on the 100 best places in the United States for women to work. So I, I, I think it's very possible to transform an organization, grow an organization, and make it a great place for women. So that's probably what I'm most proud of. Um, since I've stepped down, uh, and I know that through vision you can accomplish almost anything you want, you know, the question for me has become how can I serve? I know I can do anything I want, but what's going to make the most impact? So uh, a lot of women of my generation and men as well are realizing we're going to have a whole second career to do good and to give back in various ways. So that's what I'm kind of focusing on now. And two of my most um, fun things I'm doing as I'm, I'm a trustee of Stanford, and I've always done a lot of work for Stanford. I love Stanford. And to be a trustee is truly an honor. You really get to see the university from a whole different perspective. And I also sit on the Catalyst board. I don't know how many of you know about Catalyst, but every woman should know about Catalyst. They are probably the premier think tank for women in business globally. And uh, it's great, it's really a tremendous opportunity to sit right there and listen to their ideas germinating and, and to contribute to the focus and direction of that organization. So I'm looking forward um, to the next couple of years and uh, we'll probably have panels going forward on, on how to make this transition from your full-time career to the next <laughs> part of your life. I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Mary. Our next speaker is Beth Cross, and I had the pleasure of having Beth uh, as a speaker in my class, Work and Family, this year. Um, Beth is a co-founder and CEO of Ariat, the largest equestrian footwear and clothing company, and she has uh, also worked to make her company uh, woman-friendly and family-friendly. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mary. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am... Uh, uh, our company is in Union City, so we run a local business here. Um, we do uh, equestrian footwear and apparel targeting uh, top riders around the world, and it's a small company. So I think I bring tonight to this panel the perspective of an uh, entrepreneur um, and a small business manager. Um, I'm married. Uh, we have three children, 11, 11, and 14. Um, I grew up in Pennsylvania, um, raised on a 55-acre farm. Um, I'm number seven out of eight children. And uh, my mom ran the farm while my father um, ran a mechanical contracting business. And she also managed all the books and the accounting for him uh, while he was running his business. And now my brother runs the business that my dad ran. Um, on the farm, we raised pigs and sheep and horses and goats. Um, I had uh, a real interest in horses, and from that interest in horses, it has since um, helped me uh, in the current business that I'm in, which I'll talk about in a moment. I um, graduated from the University of Colorado, um, uh, got my bachelor's degree in political science, only took 10 years to get through the University of Colorado Boulder, which I think is average um, <laughs> for <laughs> students there. Um, and as soon as I graduated uh, there, I came to Stanford and got my MBA in 1988. Um, right out of Stanford, I went to work at Bain and Company as a strategy consultant um, and was staffed to Reebok. And it was the, uh, the combination, the integration of my background with horses, 
um, in my life uh, growing up on the farm with uh, working and really being immersed in the footwear industry, especially athletic footwear, uh, was the genesis for uh, Ariat International. And Ariat, uh, we make high performance footwear and apparel. And we entered the market at a time when uh, riding boots and clothing was um, very much an accessory and wasn't technical and didn't have any features and benefits. So we saw what was being done at Reebok and applied the same methodology and formula for success and market entry uh, into a very niche uh, market, which is uh, riding around the world. And we applied kind of athletic um, technology into that market. And uh, it's, uh, we started that business in 1992. Um, so we're about 14 years into it, 15 years. Um, and today, uh, we are arguably the largest. Um, I'm sure there's uh, other ways to define the market, but my three years at Bain taught me how to define the market in such a way that we could become the largest in the market. So I can define it anyway, and we can find some way of being number one. Um, but we have, uh, um, we sell all over the world. Um, we outfit top Olympic riders from almost every country that competes in the Olympics. We have about 200 employees. We'll do about $150 million in sales this year. Um, and uh, really, it's a really fun business uh, to run and to, uh, and to be a part of. Um, we manufacture everything overseas. And so um, for me, the biggest challenge at Ariad is not only building the business, building a great brand and a good culture, but surviving it uh, personally. My husband and I, as I mentioned, have three children. Our first child, our oldest son, was born the day we started shipping product. Um, and then two years later, we had a set of twins. Um, so we had three children under two, um, well, two and under, um, during a, the startup years with the company. So it really was a, a tremendous challenge. Um, and as I look back at the challenges that we have, both in the past and going forward at Ariat, the two hardest ones are clearly the people issues at work, creating a great culture, supporting people, um, both men and women, although we'll probably talk more uh, this evening about how we support uh, women and families. Um, and then also the personal challenge, which is how to partner with my husband to raise our kids to be great people, um, have a strong work ethic, and make good decisions. So it's that balance between being a great parent and, and a, a great CEO. I struggle with that every day. Um, the inspiration uh, for me, I think, is um, it has to be my family. I, I first, uh, as I answered this question, I said it's my mom, thinking, you know, kind of the, uh, kind of the overarching theme of women and, and how women can be successful. But it certainly would have to be both my mom and my dad. Um, but my mother in particular, um, having eight children, and she had two sets of twins, so she had six kids in four years, if you can imagine that. None of them adopted. Um, and uh, ran the farm, ran my dad's business for him. I mean, just tremendous strength, incredible work ethic. Um, and uh, she is just, uh, she remains an inspiration to me. Um, and she really never, ever uh, talked about gender as a, as a challenge. Um, and she's one of the strongest people I know. So it's a, a wonderful role model for me. And I think about, um, how I've tried, attempted to pave the way, and I have the, um, the good fortune of traveling a road that's been paved ahead of me by people such as yourself and some of the other people we'll honor here tonight. Um, so my job on that um, already paved road is to uh, work in my small world, which is Ariat, and create a great culture there, um, support uh, the people in our office, and then I take very seriously my job to um, really uh, provide inspiration to our children, be a great role model for my daughter, and uh, really teach our boys how to um, balance their lives and integrate um, their lives, both professional and personal, with strong women um, and create great partnerships with women. Thanks. Thank you, Beth. Our third panelist is Christiana Shi, and Christiana is a <coughs> senior partner at McKinsey uh, in the Orange County office. And she was the first woman who became a senior partner in what is arguably one of the world's best consulting firms um, by working part-time for 10 years. And that was a first. And uh, Christiana truly paved the way because after her, what did you say, 26 women are now? 
uh, 26 women have been elected partner at McKinsey after working part-time. Well, it's lovely to be here. I, um, I laughed when I saw the title of the session was Women Paving the Way, because a couple of years ago we had a, a big anniversary celebration for the McKinsey office that I'm in, and they laid out the career paths of some notable folks from the office. And so there I was up on the chart. I've been at McKinsey 20 years, so I'm old enough now that I go on charts and things. <laughs> And it looked so neat. It was like she did this, and then she went here, and then she did this thing. And, and I, you know, I sort of look at it, and I can see how that might look to somebody now. Very conscious decisions, very deliberate, weighed the choices, made a left. It, you know, it, it didn't feel like that at all at the time. It felt like I was making it up as I went, and I was one bad decision away from being unemployed, right? That's <laughs> pretty much what it felt like. But it, in, in reality, it takes a lot of folks to try those kind of things, to truly pave the way. And at least part of what I've done is now much more standard at, at McKinsey. So I think we have a lot more to pave, but I think we're, we're on the road and, and we can see the path. So as far as a little more background on me, I started at the firm in 1988, right out of business school, in the San Francisco office. And I had picked management consulting because I'd been in investment banking for three years in New York, and I thought this would be a better lifestyle. <laughs> so it just tells you that it's all relative. <laughs> In the fifth year at McKinsey, which is right when you are in the race for election, I got pregnant. And I went in to tell the senior partner in our office that I was pregnant. And by the way, I was the only woman in the office, so it's not like this was a common conversation that he would have. And he surprised me by saying, oh, we've just designated you associate principal, which is the next step to election. And I said, oh, I'm pregnant. <laughs> and it was not the conversation he wanted to have. So. Uh, you know, from there, I think I realized I was kind of in a, in a new land. And I think somewhere along the second or third month of my maternity leave, when the phone calls were escalating for my colleagues to come back, because you took sort of six weeks back then. You did not take four to six months. That You might as well quit. So around six or eight weeks, the calls started coming about coming back. I realized I was going to have to figure out a way to work at McKinsey if I wanted to come back that I could do for some longer period of time. And I, had, at that time, had just started working and consulting specifically in retail. And I had discovered my people. I mean, I really loved it. I've always loved to shop. So it was no big surprise that I was drawn to the industry. But having a chance to actually work with some of the top retailers in the country and take them to the next level was just too exciting for me to walk away from. So I, I had a reason to want to try to work it out. But I had a son at home who, as soon as I got home, I forgot all about work and just wanted to be there. So about two months into being back, I saw an article, and I, I swear to you, this is the way it works. I saw an article about HP, where there were some women doing a job share or something at Hewlett Packard. And it, you know, it was about how they did this, and they arranged their week, and whatever, and it all sounded very nice and plausible. So I went into, again, this poor senior partner's office. This is Bill Meehan, who Mary knows, who had to deal with all these things for the first time for the firm. And I said, you know, I read this article, these women, their job sharing. I'd like to job share at McKinsey. <laughs> you know, I mean, for starters, what's a job share? And, you know, this is a 724 client on call, client comes first, service-oriented profession. So, but, but to his credit, what he said was, well, why don't you go figure out what that would look like? I think, honestly, now he was just trying to buy a little time before he said no. But what he said was, and I use this now, go, you go think about what that could look like. Come back, tell me, and then we'll see. And I actually did a fair amount of homework. And it was, you know, it was before the tipping point, let's call it. I, I would still say we're not quite past the tipping point of part-time. But it was in the, you know, sort of innovator, early adopter stage for sure. But I, there was enough that I could find of examples that I could make something up. So I wrote it up. I said, I want to work four days a week. And I want to have one clean day at home because that way we travel a lot in my, in my field. So that way I know three days a week no matter what I'm home. And that's, that's the key for me. It was less about how long my other days were and more I'm home those days. I can make commitments. I can take them to the pediatrician. I can go to the mommy and me group. I can be home. And, you know, it actually had to go all the way from the San Francisco office up to, you know, McKinsey and Company, New York, for, for it to come back down and say, okay. And the okay was, okay, but you can only do it for six months because we think this is your reentry program. And after six months... You better be ready to come right back at it because we want to elect your partner, but you got to show us that you're committed and so on. And I said, fine. Six months went by. They didn't ask me anything. I didn't say anything. 
Another six months went by, they elected me. And, and again, nobody said anything. I think there was an implicit understanding, they thought, my colleagues and I, that I would come back to work full time. She just got elected for crying out loud. you know. She, but I thought, you know what, I'm gonna wait till somebody actually says to me, you gotta come back full time. They never said it. So I kept working part time and I, you know, it's a constant juggling every single day. You know, you, you, we all have to get very good, obviously, at saying no and drawing boundaries. But if you're really only getting paid for 80%, you don't want to give away 20, right? So I had a slightly stronger desire, maybe, to draw those parameters. But I still say it's a life skill for everybody. But I, you know, sort of kind of constantly juggled that for another six years or so. And, you know, things started to work out. And I had my own clients, and I was, I'm, you know, building a reputation in the retail field, and I was on a committee that elects uh, partners in, in the expert areas within McKinsey, and, you know, I think, honestly, everybody forgot I was part-time, and I kind of forgot. It was just the way I worked, and so I got elected director. And I think only afterwards do we all look back, and the firm looks back at that as such a watershed moment. That's why it ends up on charts now. At the time, it, there was a certain naturalness to it, and what I regret in our firm is we have since periodically taken our eye off of that because we feel like we're getting somewhere. We have enough women now that are partners. A lot of them are part-time. We've elected others part-time director, not just Christiana. Clearly, this isn't just a one-time thing. We can just let this roll. Whenever we take that attitude, we, we see our women and our pipeline narrow down again. So uh, I think the lesson learned over time is you can pave the way, but you need people continuously walking on it for it to really stay useful to everybody else that comes behind. Thank you. What a great story. <laughs> um, our fourth panelist is Colleen Stone, and she is the founder and CEO of InSpa, a spa chain that has grown, your program says, to eight locations in Washington and California, but she just told me that she has now nine locations. And she has uh, spent 10 years and has had 100 angel investors. And she is just now getting her first funding from a venture capitalist. Thank you. So uh, I'm a huge believer that uh, a lot of entrepreneurial stories come from people's individual backgrounds. And that's what I always tell people is somewhere in your own history is the idea for uh, a business. And so here's mine. I, um, after I graduated uh, as an undergraduate in economics, I thought, I want to start a business. Uh, this was in 1978, 79, and I don't think most people knew how to say the word entrepreneur, much less spell it. So uh, I started a little business up in the Seattle area that had to do with sports for children. And in the next couple of years, while all my undergraduate friends were going to graduate school, I started this little business, and it failed. And the next thing I knew, I was about 23, 24 and a half years old, and I owed as much money as my friends who'd gone to graduate school, but I didn't have a graduate degree, I just had a big debt. Uh, or as somebody said, a degree in the you know, school of hard knocks. So uh, at that time, it was 1980, 81, and there was a, a first time ever that the uh, uh, retail stock brokerage firms were hiring women, which seems not like a novelty anymore, but it certainly was at the time. So I went to work for uh, Smith Barney, and I cold called for a living, and I hated it from the first day, but I did it for six years. Um, and um, so through my, through my 20s, I married, and then I divorced, and I got to the end of my 20s, and I went, oh my goodness, what in the heck am I going to do? I hate what I do. I'm divorced. But all I'd ever wanted to do was learn more about the business world because the one thing about the stock brokerage world I liked was reading the red herrings about new businesses. So uh, fortunately, uh, I am from the class of 1989 at Stanford Business School. We have uh, one earning thing that we are all notable for, which we were the oldest average age of any class that's ever started at the business school. And I contributed to that number because I was 32 when I started. Uh, graduated at 34 and went to Wall Street. I was as old, I was a first year associate, I was as old as many of the managing directors, which made for odd dynamics, and um, stayed for roughly five and a half years. And um, while it was fine work, uh, I was still more interested in our customers than I was raising the money, which 
told me I was in the wrong place. So I literally quit my job with investment banking. I bought a Jeep and I drove cross country by myself. It took about nine weeks. Yes, I know it's not that long across the country, but I took a circuitous route. And I was fortunate enough along the way to reconnect with one of my business school professors who I said, well, my dream is I'm going to start a little business or buy a little business. You know how everybody thinks from business school that's what they're going to do. And he kind of looked at me like, "Uh uh-huh, right. And he said, well, you don't have any operating experience. So he said, why don't you think about maybe working for someone else for a couple years? And it turned out the CEO of a company that he was very good friends with was looking for someone kind of with skills like myself. So instead of returning to Seattle, which is where I'm from, to find a little business to buy. I ended up in Los Angeles uh, at a company called Merle Norman Cosmetics, which is an old line, old, old, middle American cosmetic company. It was a highly dysfunctional company, I'll just say that out loud. Um, uh, And however, because it was so highly dysfunctional, they let me do all sorts of things that nobody else without any operating experience would have ever gotten to do. And that was the genesis of the business that I now have, because this was in 1997, 98, and all uh, parts of little sleepy towns in uh, middle America, our franchise owners were asking us if we would create a Merle Norman day spa. And I thought, what a great idea, because I'd grown up in Seattle and I'd watched Starbucks grow up. And so I thought, we'll do Starbucks for the spa business. Yeah, and the 88-year-old owner of the company literally said, wait till I'm dead. Okay, (laughs) now, his mother died when she was 96, so I thought there was still a few years to go. And I guess that's like, you know, the, the, that was the flag that got waved in front of me. And I said, I'm leaving. And I did. And I'm going to do it myself. And uh, so we did. I decided to move back to start the business in Seattle. Interestingly, my alternate choice would have been to do it here in the Bay Area. And um, because I kind of thought that. And so our concept was it was going to be one hour day spas for all the rest of us. And the idea being that the only thing out there was really high and expensive stuff for the really rich people or cheap nail shops. And I thought, wow, there's a big middle. And why don't we take a shot at it? Well, it turns out that there I was in Seattle in uh, 1998, 99, attempting to raise money, think about this, for a business that was principally for women in retail, uh, the spa business, heaven forbid, in the middle of the boom of technology. And so guess what? No no money from the traditional investors. However, I was very fortunate, one of the first people, speaking of people who paved the way for me, to be introduced to um, a man who was at that time a lawyer who um, uh, is actually now on our board of directors, who had been Howard Schultz's lawyer when they were writing the business plan for Starbucks. They sat at the kitchen table in a little house and wrote this thing together. And he said to me, you know, Howard couldn't convince anybody that anybody was going to pay money for coffee at that time. Why don't you see if you can earn, you know, raise the money from people who you think might be customers, meaning women. Well, at that time, there were very few, at least official, women angel investors. It was all kind of the boys club. And so I was very fortunate to get, speaking of paving the way, a number of women who said, well, I'll just have a little lunch for you, and you can tell your story. So instead of the big razzle-dazzle, well, first of all, you know, PowerPoint barely existed. But anyways, we went out, and we, I started literally having these little lunches, and one woman would tell another, and one woman would write a check. And um, the next thing I knew, we had built enough of a business. We had three stores. Uh, we, we had been approached by a venture capital group. Um, and we signed a term sheet, and then uh, it really it felt didn't feel right during the process. They, they started to not look like the warm, fuzzy, friendly group that they had implied that they were, and so we decided to turn the money down uh, and go on on our own, and we did. We turned it down on September 10th, 2001. Um, I still contend it's the best business decision we ever made. Uh, however, it meant for the next four or five years that there was, if you'll pardon my terrible pun, we hung on by our fingernails and, um, and raised, continued to raise small amounts of money from mostly women uh, angel investors who believed in the idea. Because the one thing we had from the first day was customers. We, it's, we were priced about 20% below the 
high-end market. We have a no-tipping policy. We pay our employees as employees, so and they, they are in about the 75th to 85th percentile for wages in the industry. So the, it was a win-win-win, more based on Starbucks model. If, if you treat everybody well, you'll have very low turnover, and you can afford to have lower prices, and a much everybody can win in the scenario. So we were doing all those things, um, and but it was really, for much of the time period, we were held out of the so-called venture marketplace because we just didn't fit that. And so my really fortunate paving of the way has been that all along through it there have been individuals who said, well, maybe there's another way to do it. So just because the whole world thinks you have to do it this way, you know, come up with an idea, go to the venture capitalist and sell your soul, um, you know, why don't you try this other way? And so, and one of the probably most helpful things is this lawyer, uh, like I said, who's on my board now, he one time in his office, he walked over to this really, really thick notebook and he pulls it open and he hands it to me and he said, what's that say? And I said, 117. And he says, that's the number of angel investors in Starbucks before they took any venture money. So he said, don't let anyone tell you there's only one way to do it. And I think that would be my message is, uh, don't let anyone tell you there's only one way to do business. Another fantastic story. So I think we should open it up and let's see what questions you all have for the panelists. I'm curious if you have any advice for uh, women who are just regular old people or, <laughs> <laughs> or somebody among us who might not want to be CEO or might not want to go out and start something huge, who just wants to have a normal, nice life, even if we're you know, smart women to begin with, or people. Thanks. You need to have the life that's right for you and that you want. And uh, for me, um, getting clear on what I wanted was not a simple question because we have all had a lot of programming and a lot of um, family expectations and uh, it, it was a couple year process to um, figure out what I really like to do and I, I sort of broke it down into um, activities and feelings that I wanted more of. I tried to focus on more of those things in my life and I think sometimes if you start by trying to define the ultimate destination, not only is that very difficult, but I think it's almost impossible. I'm not sure there is an ultimate destination at the end of the day. You heard a lot of serendipity in these <laughs> stories, and that's a, a real force in life. And if you can get clear on what you want more of from the level of your, you know, your inner feelings of peace and satisfaction, and you know, continually to make baby steps in those directions, uh, it's very helpful. In terms of bigger goals, um, I always, for whatever reason, wanted to be a lead trial lawyer, and I always like to be out there leading. It's just innate in me, uh, and that's not true for everybody. And you've got to figure out what is your, you know, what is the, what are the things that really turn you on, and that will give you a happy life. And I don't think that that's unique to people on this panel. I think, uh, you know, it's sort of what you have to do to be satisfied, no matter what you know, your aspirations are, what your, uh, what, you know, wh what kinds of jobs or, or anything else you want in your life. Yeah, I would, I would also say what you want is going to change. So this, this decision of whether you want to, you know, a, a certain kind of career or you don't want that kind of career or you want to be an entrepreneur or you want to work in corporate America, you're going to revisit that many times. I think I'm just starting to discover what Mary said, which is I'm realizing I've got at least one, probably two more careers ahead of me. And so having figured out McKinsey doesn't mean I'm done. And I also decided about a year ago that my son's in high school. He's only got a few more years at home, and then he's going away. And I didn't want to be on the road the way that McKinsey people are, the way that it goes with the profession. And so about six months, six, 12 months ago, I arranged with my firm to do something different for the next two to three years. I'm doing an internal project changing the way we serve clients. And it means I'm not doing client service, which was something that I got out of bed to do for 20 years. But the trade-off for me is I'm home, and I get to go to all the parent things I need to do with my son. And it feels exactly right to be doing that right now. And you have to have that kind of conviction to, to make that kind of change. Uh, I have one piece of advice, or maybe it's two, um, which I learned the hard way, if you can think about back on my story. By all means, it's OK to do work that you love to do. Okay. You're not required to work at something that really doesn't work for you, even if everyone in the world, including your parents, um, think that it's what you should do. Um, and everyone believes that it will give you the, you know, the right resume for the rest part of your life. Actually, this is your life, so it's really not about building a resume. 
Um, I would say fun is also not a dirty word. Um, and finally, we had a rule from the very beginning, which we have continued to uh, subscribe to. It was called the no asshole rule. And we would not accept even a wealthy uh, shareholder if I perceived that that might be the type of person they were. So I would just use those as, um, that's my advice. I would say one more thing, and that is um, whatever decisions you make early on, recognize that your mind might change later and try not to close doors. So for instance, if you decide to leave the workforce for a short period of time, uh, keep up your contacts, um, keep your networks, keep your skills, uh, and realize that you three or four years later, two or three years later, may want to change your direction. Uh, Beth and Colleen, it was great to hear your stories, and uh, you're commended for building such successful businesses and for persevering. I guess one question I have for both of you is you all were both first-time CEOs, and I'd like to hear that thought process that you went through to recruit in more experienced management and how you built the team under you, recognizing that you didn't have a base of experience and really dealing with that both in um, terms of being a woman but also just in overcompensating for the fact that you hadn't done it before. What sort of lessons did you learn and can you talk about that experience? Um, well, one of the things is, is if you actually are the founder and the entrepreneur behind it, um, it's mostly hard for the rest of the world to argue with you being the CEO. So in some ways you can kind of back into it first time out. Um, I was very fortunate that there were, I, I happened to meet individuals. I, I did have a belief that you should try to find the best people possible, even if they had skills that were way above yours. And so we have a senior team of four. Three of the four are women. Uh, that wasn't more or less conscious. It just was they were the best people at that time. And what they were, I think, buying into wasn't, it couldn't have been uh, my skill set in it. It was about the vision of the business. And so, and I, what I found is that um, at certain levels for decision making, people really will pick the idea above the individual. And so that's really how I guess I compensated for it. I don't know. Beth? Yeah, I, the um, metaphor I've always uh, thought about, and it's comforting actually, is to think of uh, my role as more of a coach. And so when you're building the team, I don't wake up in the morning and think I have to play all the positions because there's no way. Um, but I have learned how to recognize you know, great athletes that do have the skills. And even, of course, great coaches make mistakes as they're building their team um, and their franchise. Um, so you know, what we really thought about was what are, the, um, what are all the functions that need to um, that need to be filled, what are all the positions on the field that need to be played, and then just look for the very best people that could fill those positions. And in the early days, of course, you make enormous compromises in terms of uh, who you can recruit, who you can afford to have. Um, and then once you get that first team on, it's not being afraid, and it's tough sometimes to just cut them from the team, you know, as you're continuing to improve and you're able to attract a better, higher caliber of person, you know, that's more able to um, handle the business as the big business gets bigger and gets more complicated. So that's the kind of reading I did um, a lot of was, you know, coaching and building out teams and, and leadership, which I still find the hardest thing about the job is, is leadership skills. Um, because learning leadership, um, you know, as we like to say, on the job training, that's hard. And, it's an incredibly vulnerable place to be, which would be my comment back to regular people. No, I don't think any of us feel more regular um, than anybody in this room because the jobs we have, um, at least I, I can speak for myself, the job that I have is an incredibly humbling job um, because you know the uh, making mistakes every day, your team bailing you out, um, but it's only through uh, you know. I think leadership skills and being able to bring in people that really complement each other, not necessarily complementing you, but complement each other as a team where you can have that kind of success. And then you have a team that's really ready to be led when you're ready to lead it. So it's kind of a leapfrog process, I've found. I was 
wondering if you could talk a bit more about your choices with work and family and how you respond to women with very strong beliefs about how you should be spending your time and, and conflicts, I guess, between women um, about those sorts of issues? Um, I think um, that uh, everyone's got to do the right thing for themselves. Uh, and I think uh, it would be very helpful to all women if we were all a little lighter in our judgments about the choices people make. People are complicated and their life situation is complicated. And uh, the pendulum swings in terms of what people think is necessary to really raise great kids and to make sure that your family has, is getting enough attention. And I think you can do the best for yourself by keeping an open mind and talking to a lot of people and getting their life stories. And the ones that resonate with you are basically the ones that probably would work for you. And one story that I tell a lot is uh, I am an extremely high energy person and uh, I've got some people in the audience who could probably testify to this, but I, personally I think uh, my kids were better off getting a very um, big chunk of my time but not my full time because if they had been my major project <laughs> they would have been, you know, micromanaged into insanity. So. <laughs> Uh, that's my perspective and it, and it worked out well and I have a lot of women who've worked full-time who have great families and great kids so you talk to people like that and you'll hear that it does work if that's what you want to do um, there are other women who've been very successful balancing things in various ways and um, so I, I think that uh, it all works and it's just a question of finding the right combination for you the good news about where we're heading is the demographic drives over the next 20 years are going to give women a lot of power to create the lives they want because you're going to be a critical part of the workforce, absolutely. And so I think, I think we're gonna solve this problem in the next 20 years. And there's a lot of innovative stuff being done in corporate America and um, it's working extremely well because everybody needs to have it work. I would, I would um, I'm not sure I can build on that because I think that's a, it's a great response, and of course, sitting up here, we learn also, as well as try to impart. Um, I think some of the most fun conversations are when you get uh, working mothers together talking about um, how obnoxious non-working mothers are, and vice versa. Um, and there is a there is an us versus them on the playground at pickup at events. I mean, it, it does exist, but I think people spend so much time rationalizing and justifying their choices that they can't help but create a distance between their choices and other choices that are being made. I think as individuals, all you can do is attempt to uh, focus on the responsibility that you have and or you have been given or have asked for. And in my case, it, I have an incredible responsibility for the women and the men that work um, uh, in the company and making sure that, especially for the women, um, that we create a, um, a culture, we create a set of policies and procedures that really support them throughout their life cycle. Um, everything from uh, young girls coming in right from college, we spend a lot of time with them on how they dress, how they conduct themselves, making sure that if they want to go on and do continuing education, we make time for that. Um, I can't tell you how many pregnancies we have at any given time. They're all inconvenient. Um, I'm sure that... Never a good time. Never a good time. I, I laugh when I sometimes speak at the business school and women say, what's a good time to get pregnant? The answer is never. Um, <laughs> or whenever, and always. always, and always, <laughs> always. right. Yeah. Um, and so it's supporting people through pregnancies, um, supporting them when they come back with part-time flex time, keeping an open dialogue so it's not a taboo subject. I mean, then we have probably 20 women in our office that are in their late 60s and early 70s um, that work in customer service. So we have a little room um, with a television and a couple couches where they can take a nap in the afternoon. <laughs> Um, and then they come back to work. And so I, I don't think it's all about the years between your time your children are zero to 10. I think there's way too much focus on that. Instead, you think about people, their life cycles, what their needs are, and how to really build a culture um, that can support that. So I think that, I think in a sense, the dialogue um, should, you know, try and pull some of the emotion out of it and also just step back and look at it from a higher level. I was wondering if a few of you could share a story about a time when you weren't sure whether you should, I guess to put it uh, really bluntly or something, play by the rules 
or speak up and say something, maybe a tough time and what you decided to do and how you thought about your choice? I know I, I keep leaping for the uh, microphone, but that's kind of my personality. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, what, what I'd like to say is that I think uh, there's a, a huge issue for women in terms of uh, being assertive enough in basically male environments. There's a lot of research on it, and uh, uh, I've seen it throughout my career. It's frankly getting better. I mean, there's enough critical mass of women in a lot of environments that this particular dynamic doesn't get going. But uh, in a situation where there are too few women and very, I'm going to use a uh, flip comment, alpha dog male in the room, uh, pretty soon the women, the energy kind of gets sucked, sucked out of the room for the women and they, they won't speak enough. And um, so I've, I've learned some techniques uh, to, to make sure that I, you know, ha have it within me to just not go there if there's a dynamic like that setting up. And it's, I use um, a visualization of when I've been in a particularly powerful position where I'm being effective and I'm in a leadership role. And I kind of picture that and it, it almost uh, brings up my energy to the point where I really feel that I can contribute here and I can speak up. And uh, it, it works every time and I, I think you find that when a woman has the courage in that situation to really make a contribution just like you're being in, fully invited and there isn't this dynamic it can change things very rapidly so it's it's more of a general response to your question about when should you speak up when something's going on but I think that's kind of where it happens the most the day-to-day -day interactions where there aren't enough women and it's hard I I can think of many instances where that's happened. What I tell you is it's not just going to happen once. So as Mary said, you, you do have to figure out your way of, of thriving in those kind of situations, not just, you know, not just surviving, but actually thriving. I mean, I'll throw out a couple. You know, I'm in a client service profession. Sometimes clients are mean. You know, sometimes they want something you can't do. Sometimes what they want, they shouldn't do. And I... You know, I lost track of the number of times I've had to have the really uncomfortable conversation where the easier thing to do would have just been, you know what, that's a great idea, or when they said something that was, you know, perhaps inappropriate, just let it go because they're the client. And, and honestly, when I first joined our firm, I would say, as a woman, I sort of felt like maybe almost encouraged that, you know, let it go because, you know, they're the client and you don't want to make a big deal. I had a client that persisted in asking me out. I remember this when I was, you know, a couple of years into the firm. Just constant. I'm just, it was, you know, who knew what harassment was back then? But now I'd say it was bordering on that. And so I remember it was over the line. Yes, I remember going to. I mean, much, much older than me, and he was married, and he was a client, right? So I mean, there was nothing about it that was comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, I remember going to the partner. Yeah, I mean, I was 26 or something, 25, 26, and I went to the partner. He didn't know what to do. He was flabbergasted. It wasn't that he told me to just be quiet and be nice to the man. He just had no frame of reference, right? And I just, I had to say to the guy two, three different times, and knowing that he was a client, knowing that I'd have to keep working there, just ask him, just tell him very straight up, I'm not interested, and I actually think we should stop having this conversation. You know, once you do it once, it gets a little easier. Then there might be another time where you have to ask someone to leave the firm, and they think they're doing great, that's uncomfortable, you could let them stay, but you know, they're not gonna go where they need to go and it's really time, so you get sort of, and I think each time, what I find helpful is, I, I, I do a little bit of the visualization thing, maybe not as explicitly as what Mary's describing, but I do think about those kind of things ahead of time. I rarely just, you know, blunder right in the room and blurt something out, I'm not at my best that way. It's not that I take weeks to figure it out, but I usually sleep on it. If something's going on that makes my stomach hurt, if I can, I try to sleep on it because what I discover is and I get up in the morning, if it's still bothering me, I need to do something about it. And then my tone, I, I tend to try to take just a very straight up approach because if that works, I don't have to do anything other than that. And if it doesn't work, I'll have to have my plan B. And one other thing I would add, I think it's fundamentally disempowering to yourself to not speak up when you think you should. Mm -hmm. So you do need to do it. On the other hand, if you're, the other issue though is sometimes you can be misreading a situation and you may have a, a almost a, a blinder in your in how you read a situation so if you're getting feedback from people you trust that you're a little over the line um, then perhaps you need to look at it a little differently but for most women most of the time 
it's better to say it than not say it. I would agree because uh, I'm at nature a people pleaser, and I'm going to guess there's a few in this room as well. Um, and I think that that's the hardest part is to, to stay true to your sense of self, which it's important that you're a pleaser in many ways, and yet be willing to say no when no is the appropriate thing. And I, when I look back on decisions, probably always my biggest regret is that I took so long to get over my people-pleasing part in order to make the hard decisions. Um, I did want to say one other thing about going back to the question about children. I have no children, and I deeply regret it. And I suspect that there are probably young women in this room who are in that wondering stage. Um, I was always sure there'd be time later. And I think it's important for people to realize that actually it isn't an unlimited time period. And by the time I was thinking, well, maybe I'll just have a child by myself, then by that time the business was, it was 2001. And so it, it was, it, the time went by. And I guess I think it's important for people to hear that because we're always so sure that tomorrow is just another day and it will come. And it doesn't always. And so as you think through those decisions, I think the most important thing you heard from these three women who I think sound like awesome mothers is that you can do both. If, and it's a choice that can be made, I think, at any time. What kind of advice would you, would you give to, to men uh, when managing, you know, women in management and, you know, dealing with women in the, in the workplace, um, you know, what kind of advice you can give us? Uh, managing women or working for women? Well, <laughs> <laughs> managing the relationship with women in the workplace. <laughs> One of the things that I think um, there are there are sort of systematic biases in our country. We're lucky to be in America. America has been the best country in the world, I think, for women. But you just look at the numbers at the top, and there is something going on. There is cultural bias that tends to, I think, um, and there's a lot of research that supports this, to that that uh, women are not seen. It, women who are performing equivalently to men, particularly in organizations that are still male-dominated, their, their performance will be seen through a different lens. And so one, one technique I used with my male managers at Pillsbury was to tell them, just assume that when you're looking at people that there's about a 10 to 15 percent devaluer that you're seeing in your own way of looking at people and recognize that, uh, particularly when it comes to leadership and others, other um, attributes that historically in our country were mostly male. Uh, women are often not seen, even though they have the characteristics, as strong in those areas. And so you, you kind of adjust the way you look at things and you give women opportunities, even though you might think they weren't quite as ready as some male, the males. That's one, one thing that I would recommend. Um, I also think that it's extremely important in the workplace, especially when you have junior women and dominant strong men who are more senior to them, to use techniques of inclusion uh, to get the optimal participation from the women. You know, going around in meetings and making sure that everybody's speaking up. And things like that so that it, it, you're, you're taking some of the tension and the difficulty that women have in large groups uh, that are mostly male in speaking up. And then I think um, women often benefit greatly from mentoring relationships uh, from men. They're often more comfortable going and asking a woman to be a mentor to them. So if you can volunteer and really listen to the women and talk to them about what they're doing now and compare it to what you would do in a similar situation and give them advice, help them by creating networks to other people, make it safe for them to have male networks, that can be tremendously helpful. Yeah, um my input would be in the hiring process, I think it's really critical, uh, hiring men or women, to, to hire people who are very focused on the work and they've demonstrated an ability to, to get the work done. Because it tends to take um, a lot of the noise out of the equation. And then, you know, when we manage people in our office, we're, again, very, very focused on the work, on the output, um, how they are as team players, et cetera, and, and provide your managers and your staff with the most concrete um, performance uh, metrics uh, that you can. 
um, and then measure them to that. And it does so much to take the noise um, out of the performance review, it takes a lot of the, the tension out of the performance review. Nothing worse, and in fact, we don't allow performance reviews or feedback unless they're data-driven or tied to metrics because it, it, then people fall into and succumb to uh, biases, uh, frankly, that can exist. Um, and I think that that's, uh, it's bad for everybody, it sets a bad tone. Um, so we coach very um, strongly um, around how to define a job, how to measure the performance of the job, and then how to coach to the job. And I think that's good advice for both men and for women 